Welcome to the Men's Reformed Fellowship. This is Rich McLaren, pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Perkesy, Pennsylvania. The Men's Reformed Fellowship is a ministry of our church, which meets at the A&N Diner in Sellersville, uh, Pennsylvania, on Thursday mornings at 8 o'clock. So if you happen to be free uh, men at that time, please join with us. And uh, we have a great time of discussion. We are working our way through Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. And uh, we have a long ways to go, as you can see. So uh, we have much to consider. Uh, so it's not too late to get in. The uh, group this morning discussed the nature of the incomprehensibility of God. And we are beginning a new section in Dr. Sproul's book dealing with the nature and attributes of God. So uh, part one laid the foundation for our understanding of the scriptures. We talked about the uh, nature of revelation and how God's revelation of himself is uh, given to us in written propositional scripture, uh, a book which uh, requires us to read it intelligently, seeking to understand uh, its original intent, uh, that is, that which the uh, inspired author intended to say, as well as what God himself intended to say through the text. And uh, we are to interpret that and apply it according to the work of the Spirit in our lives. So the scriptures lay the foundation for our understanding of everything that follows. If we've properly developed a, a sound foundation of an understanding of the nature of scripture, uh, what God's revelation is in scripture, how that revelation is related to the rest of the world and to our own nature, as we understand how to interpret scripture and uh, the right to private interpretation, which we considered last week, such that we're not subject uh, to the interpretation of the church or scholars or what have you. Uh, we are subject to scripture ultimately, and the church and the fathers of the church and traditions and the, these kinds of things only have meaning and importance insofar as they are rooted in, grounded upon God's revelation in scripture. Apart from that foundation, they uh, are no more uh, of authority over the church than any other document in human history. So we go to scripture as the final authority. It is even of greater authority, authority than creeds and confessions of the church. Uh, confessions change. The Westminster Confession of Faith, as understood by American Presbyterianism, has changed over time. The confession of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church is not identical to the Westminster Confession as composed originally by the Reformers in the 17th century. Uh, our circumstances have changed somewhat. We've come to a better, I think, understanding of Scripture and its applications, particularly to uh, the Pope of Rome and the civil magistrate. And so we have, I think, a better, clearer understanding of scripture today. Um, so scripture is of ultimate authority and even creeds and confessions may undergo adjustments. The central message of our confession is the same. And it's been the same with the Christian church throughout uh, its history. So now we move on to consider what does the scripture say? And in Dr. Sproul's book, there'll be a, a variety of areas of consideration uh, he highlights about uh, eight of them altogether beyond revelation. We're going to talk about the nature and attributes of God, but then we'll talk about the works and decrees of God, uh, Jesus Christ, the person of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, human nature and the fall into sin, the work of salvation, uh, and so forth. So there's a lot yet to cover uh, in this book. And the great thing about Dr. Sproul's book is that it's just a page or two of a very concise summary statement on this particular, that particular doctrine. And, uh, and then there are summary statements at the end of that to uh, put it together for you even more simply, and also uh, at times uh, discussion questions and um, 
scriptures to, to look at to meditate on the topic further. So a very helpful book, and I uh, hope that you will take some time at least to follow along with us as we make our way through the book. Okay, now as we begin the uh, second part of Dr. Sproul's book on the nature and attributes of God, we begin with the doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God. Now don't let that frighten you in that uh, language, the incomprehensibility of God. We'll uh, make it comprehensible for you. We'll help you understand what that doctrine is actually teaching about God and our knowledge of Him, and then we'll work our way from there. Uh, so let's get started. And uh, Dr. Sproul begins in, in the following words. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth was asked by a student during a seminar in the United States, Dr. Barth, what is the most profound thing you have ever learned in your study of theology? Barth thought for a moment and then replied, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The students giggled at his simplistic answer, but their laughter was of a nervous sort as they slowly realized that Bart was serious. Um, if you take a moment to think about that uh, verse from one of our children's hymns, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, and so forth. If you listen to that and just take a moment to reflect on Jesus, loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, you, you take a look at each of those segments of that initial statement there, and you realize that this really is a very profound statement. Who is this Jesus? How is it that he loves me? I live 2,000 years after Jesus lived on this earth, and yet he loves me? That must assume that he lives, that he is in heaven, and that he has a specific, unique relationship with me, a personal relationship with me. He loves me, and I know it. I don't just suppose it and, or speculate upon it. It's not just something of a possibility, but I know it. And how do I know it with certainty, with, with certitude? Well, because the Bible tells me so. I believe what the scriptures say about Jesus and what he has come to do for me. I believe that he has paid the penalty for my sins by his death on the cross. I believe that he has done a marvelous work of grace in my heart and my life, changing me such that I know Jesus. I don't know him perfectly or completely by any means, but I know him and he knows me and loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Well, it is a very profound statement, and so what we're going to do with this statement is use it as a window into the whole subject of theology. Uh, really, when we talk about the incomprehensibility of God, we are talking about the mystery that uh, surrounds every doctrine of theology. Every aspect of life really is surrounded by a certain measure of mystery. There are things that which we know, we know truly, but we certainly don't know fully or completely. Um, there's always something more beyond our grasp, something more to consider or understand. It's one of the confessions of those of us who have been in the faith for quite some time, some of the mature saints, that as they go to the scriptures, they continue to see more and more uh, unfolded in there. As we see interrelationships and developments of themes and ideas throughout Scripture, it, it, it's something where we continually grow and appreciate in our understanding of the Scriptures. So, uh, Dr. Sproul continues, Bart gave a simple answer to a question of profundity. In doing so, he was calling attention to at least two vitally important notions. First, that in the simplest Christian truth, there resides a profundity that can occupy the minds of the most brilliant people for a lifetime. Second, that even in learned theological sophistication, we never really rise above a child's level of understanding the mysterious depths and riches of the character of God. 
So uh, f first of all, I want to emphasize that uh, all truth, it, all Christian truth has a simplicity about it on the surface, but there's a profundity, there's a depth uh, of insight and knowledge that undergirds each and every concept so that when we begin to explore those depths of revelation in God's word, we begin soon to find out that we are in, in uh, very deep water. And uh, it, it's a very uh, humbling experience. So there's a surface knowledge, which the smallest child can understand, but then there's a depth knowledge to scripture that challenges uh, the most brilliant scholars on earth. And then... Uh, Dr. Sproul says that uh, we, we never rise above a child's level of understanding. It's not to say that adults never know more than children, but it's simply to say that in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the vast sum of the revelation of God, we only capture just a portion of that revelation. And indeed, there are many things beyond that revelation which we cannot begin to grasp or understand. So. Uh, even the most mature, seasoned, uh, brilliant theologian must confess that in his understanding of God, he is yet a child and still needs to learn and to grow. Um, it, it's the, the, the wise theologian who has come to understand that and is always hungering to learn more and appreciate more about the Word of God. So uh, this was... Karl Barth, and uh, Karl Barth's theology is neo-Orthodox theology, and uh, it's not um, Reformed theology, although he, he endeavored uh, and professed to try to be uh, 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 one who restored a Reformed understanding of the Scriptures, but he really didn't do that. Um, he he uh, led the church, uh, uh, I believe, astray in some of his more, if you will, Hegelian ideas. But um, anyway, the, the comments that he makes here are, are quite accurate as far as the surface meaning of them goes. So Sproul says, John Calvin used another analogy. He said that God speaks to us in a kind of lisping as parents engage in baby talk when addressing their infant children, so God, in order to communicate with us lowly mortals, must condescend to speak to us in lisps. Now, you've no doubt seen uh, new parents speaking their, their baby and using cuckoo and, and goo goo and ah ah and things like that. And, using all kinds of baby language. Being a bachelor, obviously I'm having a hard time <laughs> coming up with that kind of thing. But parents will, will speak to their children in very simple terms and, and uh, try to express their love and appreciation for the child and, uh, and then at times begin to instruct the child as well. But the, the adult doesn't use adult language in talk in adult forms with a child. The adult uh, condescends to the child's level and tries to communicate in ways that the child will understand. And at first it's a very simplistic thing, but over time it increases in complexity and depth. And so that's how God ministers to us. He is a parent who condescends to us. He lowers himself and as uh, Calvin puts it, he lisps to us. He, he speaks in ways which are readily understandable uh, for us. Uh, if you take a moment to watch uh, last Sunday's sermon at First Presbyterian Church from uh, John's Gospel, the fifth chapter, verses 30 through 47, uh, the title of the sermon is Witnesses to Transcendent Truth, or Transcendent Witness to Truth, I think is the way it should have read. Anyway, um, Jesus uh, talks about the witnesses that support his claim to being the Son of God, and how can there be an adequate, adequate witness to his divine nature? Surely, finite individuals can give something of a witness, but it's not an adequate witness. It's not com a complete witness, rather. Um, Jesus' divinity 
must be confirmed by the divine nature. And in Christian theology, uh, God is a trinity. So the Father witnesses to the Son that the Son is divine. The Son witnesses to the Father. The Spirit witnesses to the Father and the Son. And uh, I, I neglected to mention in that sermon, but I, I mentioned it after the offering, if you see the entire worship service for that Sunday. That's October 14th, 2018. I, I noted that in uh, the religions of Islam and Judaism, which have Unitarian gods, gods with one person, there's not an independent, separate witness to the divinity uh, uh, of Allah or Jehovah that is on a level with Allah and Jehovah. Allah witnesses and testifies to himself. Now, we understand in our human courts that if I give testimony uh, of my behavior and I have nothing to back up that testimony, then while the testimony may be true in and of itself, because there's no independent witness or support for that, then it just falls silent. Uh, th there's no standing for that witness, that testimony. And so when Jesus affirms that he is the Son of God, uh, the real uh, uh, support, the real witness for that confession is the witness of the Father who is God and the witness of the Spirit who is God. And so the Father witnesses to the Son through the works that the Son performs, the miracles that the Son performs. The Spirit witnesses to the Son through the Scriptures and the Word of God that explains the nature of the coming Christ. And so Father and Spirit testify to the Son and confirm that the Son is indeed the Son of God, fully and equally uh, God with the Father and the Spirit. Allah has no such witness uh, Jehovah has no such witness in the Judaistic understanding of God. They are Unitarian gods, and so therefore their testimony to the divine nature falls flat. There's no corroborating evidence for the divine being there that is on a level of divinity. And so their testimony is always going to be inadequate. Well, um, so that brings us back here to our conversation here. Uh, Jesus uh, understood our nature and how we needed to appeal to on our level. And so he reminded the Jews of his day that you had seen John the Baptist. You had observed his preaching. You saw his life. You saw one who was like a prophet out in the wilderness and great crowds came to him. You rejoiced in his preaching because he preached the law. He preached repentance. And you didn't benefit from it by actually repenting yourselves, but you rejoiced for a while in his ministry. John testified of me, Jesus says. And so Jesus stoops to our level in this instance and in many others with, with the witness of John the Baptist, with the witness of the miracles that they observed in the healings that took place in his ministry. All these things bore testimony to the divine nature of Jesus. So God uh, condescends to our level to speak to us so that we may understand God. And we are not like Karl Barth or others who had difficulty with the concept of God communicating to us in language that we know and having his revelation um, uh, contained within propositions, the statements of the Hebrew and Greek Bible. God, in their view, is not limited by these things. He is far surpassing them. He is not bound by time, and so he is eternal, and so he cannot condescend to that level. In true Christian theology, God does condescend and being all-powerful, all-wise, he is able to communicate it to us truly and effectively through fallible instruments, finite instruments, to communicate to us infallible truth that we can rest on for our eternal salvation. So uh, Calvin was right that God condescends to our level to explain himself to us, to talk to us about himself. Sproul continues, No human being has the ability to understand God exhaustively. There is a built-in barrier that prohibits a total, comprehensive understanding of God. We are finite 
creatures. God is an infinite being. Therein lies our problem. How shall the finite comprehend the infinite? Medieval theologians had a phrase that has become a dominant axiom for all subsequent study of theology. The finite cannot grasp or contain the infinite. Nothing is more obvious than that an infinite object cannot be squeezed into a finite space. You might uh, consider this on a human level in terms of uh, the ocean. I live within two hours of the Atlantic Ocean, and if I were to go there and look out on the horizon, the, the, the ocean goes far beyond anything that I can see. And if I came up to the, the shore with a thimble or even with a bucket and tried to capture the whole ocean in that thimble or, or bucket, uh, obviously I would not be able to do that. The ocean is far greater than anything that I can grasp on my own. Uh, this is something of what happens when the theologian comes to divine revelation. God himself and his nature and his being is far beyond anything that we can truly know completely. And so in our finite way, we try to understand something of God. We get a bucket of that ocean water and we know something truly about God. But clearly, we don't grasp everything about God. God is far beyond us, far greater than us. He is transcendent. He is far above us. So the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. This axiom conveys one of the most important doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. It is the doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God. The term can be misleading. It may suggest to us that since the finite cannot grasp the infinite, that we can know nothing about God. If God is beyond human comprehension, does that not suggest that all of our religious talk is only so much theological babbling and that we are left with, at best, an altar to an unknown God? So Sproul is trying to guard us from a misconception with regard to the incomprehensibility of God. And it's important to note this because there are theologians who have said that God is absconditus. He is uh, uh, the hidden God. And we cannot know him, at least in any way. Uh, really, all that modern theology uh, would tell us of God is that we can sense him, we can feel him. We have an impression of the divine, but really to explain God, to define God, to uh, make certain propositions about God which are true or false, that is beyond what theology in the modern age is able to do. Uh, we have a, a sense of the presence of God, a sense of the power of God, and these things give us a sense of awe and of worship, but what it is we are worshiping we really cannot say. And that's not the idea of incomprehensibility in uh, the Christian way of thinking, uh, or if you will, the Reformed understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, God is incomprehensible in that he is far beyond us, but that doesn't mean we cannot know him truly. He does reveal himself to us in ways which we can understand, and Dr. Sproul will explain that further. He writes, this is by no means the intent. The incomprehensibility of God does not mean that we know nothing about God. Rather, it means that our knowledge is partial and limited, falling short of a total or comprehensive knowledge. The knowledge that God gives of himself through revelation is both real and useful. We can know God to the degree that he chooses to reveal himself. The finite can grasp the infinite, but the finite can never hold the infinite within its grasp. There is always more to God than we apprehend. So God reveals things to us truly. Those things that he gives us, we can grab hold of. We can understand. They are shaped and conformed in such a way that our minds can grasp them. God created our minds. He has given us our intellect. He has renewed our hearts such that we are enabled to see and understand the truths that he's given to us in his word. 
Jesus often said to the disciples and to those who were following him, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, or uh, um, in the old King James language, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Uh, Jesus spoke with uh, great uh, certainty uh, and truthfulness of those things which, which we can know. The Apostle Paul puts it in these terms. It is a trustworthy statement, worthy of all acceptation. And he talks about different things as being trustworthy. Uh, you can know these things. You cannot trust something which you don't know. Paul gives us a proposition on which we can rely upon. This is true truth, as it were, to use Francis Schaeffer's old language. Um, there are things given to us in Scripture which we can know because they are true and they are adapted to us in our creaturely finite state such that we can know them and we can be certain about them. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, and so therefore we can know them truly in the way that God has revealed them to us. The Bible says it this way, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Martin Luther referred to two aspects of God, the hidden and the revealed. A portion of the divine knowledge remains hidden to our gaze. We work in the light of what God has revealed. So uh, that verse in Deuteronomy ought to be uh, something that we pay great attention to. Um, we have things which God has revealed to us, and those things we can know, we can understand. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that by his death on the cross, he atoned for our sins. We know that God punished him in our place. He's our substitute, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We can understand that much of what God has done. There's mystery that surrounds all that, undoubtedly. There are things that go well beyond what we can know about that. But this part we can know, and that's sufficient for us for our salvation. And so it is that with God's revelation of himself in his word and in the world around us, we can know true things about God, and that's sufficient for us. We need to guard our, ourselves against speculating beyond what God has revealed and trying to go beyond or being not satisfied with God has revealed, put, pushing it aside and wishing to pursue something else. We need to receive what God has revealed of himself. That's a finite revelation given to us, adapted to us in our circumstances such that we can understand it. There are things about God which go beyond our understanding beyond our experience, and those things we leave with God. There are many places in the Bible which we can uh, see that at work. Remember Job uh, was challenged by God to explain a variety of things. Were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there when I formed and fashioned uh, the uh, Leviathan? Uh, and do you understand its nature and all these different things? There, there are aspects of God's work which go well beyond what we can know. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there were the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that God made. Uh, we don't know what's going on. We don't understand all that. Um, so there is a... Um, there, there, there's that which God's revealed, then there are things that go beyond us. And, and God at times must remind us that we are the creatures and not the creator. In order for us to know God comprehensively, uh, we need to have an infinite mind. We would have to be God. And clearly we are not gods. And uh, one of our men brought this up this morning. and It's a great point. Um, the atheist says there is no God. He makes an absolute statement. There is no God. Now, it's rather odd that the atheist who would affirm that there are no absolutes, that everything is relative, and, uh, uh, and so we cannot really know things fully and completely. At the same time, he knows enough to say that there is no God. In order for him to say that there is no God, he has to have an experience such that he has searched out all of history, all of time, the whole universe, and is able to come to the conclusion that there is no God. That is a very uh, arrogant thing to say. It's the height of hubris. 
on the part of the atheist to say that there is no God. Um, God has revealed himself to us, and on the basis of that, we can say God exists, and he is true, and we can rest on him. So uh, you have Job's uh, being humbled before God, his creator, and, and I would say, remember Job's circumstances? He suffered quite a bit, right? He, the, the book of Job begins with uh, Satan conferring with God and saying, Job trusts you only because he has his health and his wealth and all good things. Strip him of these things and he'll curse you and die. Well, God put Job to the test and uh, Satan came and took away Job's wealth. And then he destroyed his family and then he even attacked his health. And so here is Job uh, stripped of everything that he owns and in an utterly miserable condition. Uh, and from time to time we go through experiences, perhaps not quite as dramatic, certainly, but nonetheless uh, very profound. And, you know, when you come to the end of life, you're right there with Job. Everything is gone. You lose everything in death. Will you curse God and die? Or will you trust that God has you in his care in spite of what you see all around you? This is where faith comes in. We trust the promises of God. We trust God's goodness. And though I might not be able to understand everything that's happening to me or why things occur in God's providence in my life, nonetheless, because I know God, because I know he's good, wise, and powerful, I therefore know that the circumstances that I am in, including the death experience, the, the dying experience, is an experience owned and governed by God in his goodness and love for me as his child. And he will bring me safely through that so I can trust him for those things where God is hidden, those situations in life where I don't understand what God's purpose is or why he's doing the things that he's doing. But I need to learn to trust him as my father and know that he knows what is best. And uh, we can trust him. So uh, we can place our confidence in him and rest in his word. Well, I think I'll finish up there on the subject of uh, the incomprehensibility of God. Uh, that actually is, again, a very big concept that is important for the rest of theology because at every point along the way, there will be a certain measure of mystery um, surrounding Christian faith and Christian doctrine. And uh, it, it's that mystery that challenges us to live by faith, to trust God for those things which we don't know and we don't understand. So we have revelation from God. Jesus is fully God and fully man, one person. And yet there's mystery. We don't understand how all that works together. Uh, there's mystery with regard to the fact that I am a physical body, but also I have an immortal soul. I have a, a, a material, I'm a material being, but I'm also a spiritual being. A spiritual being has no point of contact with a material being, and yet clearly the body influences the spirit, the spirit influences the body. How does that relationship work? I don't know. Nobody can describe that. But clearly it does. And so... Uh, there are mysteries to things, uh, to the created world, and to God's revelation in His Word, in, in, in Scripture. Um, ultimately, we accept what God has given to us, we rest on that, and that is sufficient for us now. There will be more that God will reveal to us in a future time. Uh, when we pass from this life, or when He returns in glory, then we will see uh, far more. As the Apostle Paul put it, we see as in a glass darkly, but then face to face. Uh, things will be much clearer in that eternal day when we stand before the face of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and rejoice in Him, praise Him, and fellowship with all the saints forever and ever. May God so bless you and me that we together may join in that place of glory and peace and love and sing the praises of our great Redeemer, who even at that point, in that day of revelation, will continue to be the hidden God, far beyond us, far deeper than anything that we could explore. 
Well, this is Pastor Richard McLaren for First Presbyterian Church in Perkesy, Pennsylvania. You can learn more about our church by looking at our website, firstchurchopc.org, O-R-G. And there you'll see a, 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 our sermons and worship services in video form. So you can very much see what life is like at our church. And uh, you can find out our doctrinal beliefs and how we govern our church and these kinds of things. But the best thing is to come to church. Uh, our services are at 9.30 for our worship service and then at 11.15 for our Sunday school. So please join us for that. Uh, God bless. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Bye.